much, Luca. Uh, I enjoy being here. And I took the PhD in uh, the University of Genoa, a PhD in bioethics, back then, back in 2000. And so coming back here is like becoming younger. <laughs> so it's nice for me, and I, I'm, I'm very happy to be here to, uh, today. I would like to thank you, Kamala, for inviting me and Elisa Bricko for uh, including me in, the, in, the, in, the, in this conference. Well, uh, what I would like to do now is to trace a very short sketch of what postmodernism is, or rather has been, and what a neo-modern condition would look like. Uh, I will be, of course, brief. I cannot develop all the argument in its full length, but I will try to suggest the main features of this argument. In many ways, the question posed to our time is unprecedented. Of course, the ultimate questions of thought are the same in every age, and uh, one would even dare to say that they are the same at every latitude. For example, why being rather than nothing, to use the Leibnizian formula, or what can I know, what should I do, what can I hope for, or what is man in the synthesis proposed by Kant, or how should we live, the question posed by Socrates in the Republic by Plato, which is an introduction not only to ethics, but, but to politics and to metaphysics as well. So these are the great questions, and they don't change, really. And yet, the present time seems to require a further effort, presents higher and more serious obstacles to the attempt to understand our position in the world and our possible direction, not to mention our destiny. The awareness of many roads taken in the past and, of, and the awareness of many failed attempts, the historical conscience now made heavy by the centuries, the perception now confused but unavoidable of the limitation of our gaze and the need to trace acceptable answers for a globalized look. All these things seem to undermine our trust in the cultural resources that we should use to answer these questions. Moreover, the speed of change that we are facing, that progressive acceleration of time, which, as Hartmut Rosa has underlined, ends up generating nowadays a new sense of individual and social alienation. This acceleration and this alienation, they are a warning against every ambition to determine something stable, something lasting, and even a threat to, our, to the availability of time to create this cultural construction. We are out of time, as Marina Garcés has said, we are out of time. We, we don't have time even to think in a, in a new way, because the challenges are so fast. These characteristics, elements of the contemporary world seem to make difficult, if not impossible, the task of thinking again, of projecting ourselves into an adventure as presumptuous as that of knowing ourselves and the reality in which we are living. We are hopelessly less innocent than our forefathers with respect to such questions. We are besieged by that historical disease that Nietzsche already understood in 1874 when he published the second of the untimely meditations, uh, entitled not by chance, on the use and abuse of history for life. So the question of meaning and of the resources to try to answer to that question is certainly perennial, but the weight of historical experience and the effort of thought in the labyrinths of the philosophical tradition nowadays so heavy make the question immensely complicated for today's consciousness. Faced with this challenge, when its death is recognized, there are at least two general types of responses in contemporary culture to philosophical attitudes. Oh. There are two cultural attitudes that seem to contend for the field. The first attitude 
which I will call postmodernism, is marked by the refusal to admit the question of its meaning. The search for truth, for justice, for the good, for beauty, simply does not take place in contemporary world according to this approach, or should not take place. Indeed, it is already considered a violence, a form of hubris, and the germ of contradiction uh, to try to answer the question, because they are too big for us. In particular, the typical claim of the modernity to take upon itself the weight of this question and to carry it out with, it, with its own means, that is, reason and experience, is declared in this time bankrupt and dangerous. This research, it is said, contains its own condemnation, often identified with the demon of technology and totalitarianism. And it will carry everything with itself if we do not refuse radically the form of thought and therefore the concrete forms of living on which the whole Western tradition has been built, assuming that we can speak in bulk of something called the West. The sunset of this form of life, the sunset of the West, announced by complacent processes of Otto Spengler, is declared unstoppable and even desirable in order to leave room for a different thought, for a difference hmm, uh, with reality, as Derrida hopes, for a liberation of, from modernity and from calculating reason, uh, from that kind of rationality which is only capable of the thought of the entity and not of the being, as Heidegger used to say. This philosophical attitude, which dominated much of the 20th century, has been called, as I said, postmodern. The domination, this denomination is in some ways reductive, although in other ways it is very appropriate. It is reductive because many postmodern authors, so called postmodern authors, let's say Richard Rorty, Jacques Derrida, Gianni Vattimo, just to cite a few examples, for these authors, the area invested by the criticism of the postmodern criticism is much larger than what we call modernity. It's not only modern times that are criticized, it is the whole. Western history. Already Orkheimer and Adorno, who are in a certain sense two precursors of most postmodernism, they are not postmodern, but they announce in a way some ideas of postmodernism. Orkheimer and Adorno, they trace the dialectic of environment back to the Homeric poems. The germ of contradiction in this form of thought, the Western thought, resides in the separation between subject and object. And in the break of the original unity between man and nature. In this perspective, Odysseus, who with a straight gem listens to the sirens using his step companions as the driving force of his movement on the boat, Odysseus becomes an antiliteral emblem of enlightenment, as well as an anticipation of the bourgeois conscience and the capitalist exploitation. The criticism of the so-called uh, objectifying or instrumental or calculating thought has become a commonplace in the philosophy of the 20th century, often turning into the rejection of every form of rationality whatsoever and the proposal to abandon any hypothesis of a sense of history, every possible ontology, every conception of the subject, every paradigm of art, and every, even every theory of justice. The postmodern attitude has thus become a general form of cultural self-understanding at the end of the millennium, also thanks to expressions and evocative metaphors of a general postmodern condition, as the author has suggested. It has been said that there is an end of the great narratives, the meta-recit, uh, spoken by Lyotard. We, we have heard about the liquidity of society and of life, the metaphor used by Bauman. We have heard about the end of history, 
uh, not only Fukuyama, but Kojaev uh, at the beginning, well, during the, the 30s, 1930s, that that art, the unmasking of the subject, and the farewell to the truth. There is a book by John Latino, a very good book, one, although I do not agree with it, which is entitled Farewell to the Truth. The second type of response that can be advanced against the crisis of, of contemporary culture does not dispose of the question of meaning. Although it is dealt with it, uh, it deals with it with, with more in, in philosophical circles than in the general culture, I would call this attitude a neo-modern response to the crisis. In this case, what is in question is not the attempt to find a uh, trajectory back in history in order to find the original error of the West by which we have become what we are now. This is not the move that neo-modern the, the neo thinking takes. Rather, a neo-modern thinking uh, resumes the typical research of modernity without, however, claiming the absoluteness and conclusiveness that is often attributed to modern thought. And that in reality, as I will try to show, it is only proper to a certain twist of modernity, the, what I call the late modernity. Mm -hmm. Of this reflection, it was critical and constructive, while postmodernism is just <coughs> critical and not constructive. There is testimony, testimony in philosophy no less than in the arts and the ideas for social innovation, although these are only attempts and not a consolidated trend. I may use kind of a uh, joke, but there is, we don't have yet a theory of neo-modernity, while we have a theory of postmodern of, or postmodernity, which is called postmodernism. We don't have yet any neo-modernism, and maybe we will never have. The general character of this answer is a sort of revival of the modern instinct for rational and experiential investigation. With the awareness of limits and of dead ends that we have known in the history of modernity. In particular, this perspective is based on the critical ideal of knowledge. The latter, while refusing any dogmatism, does not renounce to construct moral and political theories. So this is something which happened recently in the last part, well, last 30, 20, 30 years uh, in the 20th century, and now it's going on, the rebirth of ethics, as it has been called. And this attitude formulates social and economic hypotheses, ideas, strange and utopian ones, such as the idea of basic universal income proposed by <laughs> Philippe Lamparas. And furthermore, it traces visions of the human that integrate scientific discoveries, especially in the field of neuroscience, with a unifying philosophic understanding of the human condition. So the attempt to offer an image of humanity and of uh, our presence in the world, which is uh, a positive world, and not just the critic of what we are not able to do. So it is not a matter of elaborating the great systems that characterize the 19th century philosophy, which is, for example, positivism and historicism. But rather, it is a matter of sketching forms of rationality and subjectivity that are able to withstand the complication of the current scenario. And as we shall see, it is to this second perspective that we should do well to dedicate our efforts nowadays, also in view of the role that the so-called Western culture can play in the contemporary globalized landscape. What, what, what does it mean to be Westerners in this globalized world? Nonetheless, postmodernism, that is, to give a summary, Definition, the sociological and philosophical theory based on the diagnosis of the end of modernity. Postmodernism has addressed to modernity three essential criticisms, which are worth thinking about. The first criticism is, according to postmodernism, 
modernity was based on the idea of a human subject who is totally sure of himself. I use, I use the masculine because one of the accusations is that the modern uh, subject is thought of in terms of masculine subject. So there is a critic in this perspective. By virtue of the famous Cartesian formula, cogito ergo sum, philosophy and modern culture together with it, as attributed to the subject that is the ego, to be precise, huh, an ontological, ontologically ultimate status. There is nothing beyond the subject. This is what uh, postmodernists think that the, the first thinkers of modernity, Cartesians for, for first, uh, have initiated. That the subject is undoubted, is something which you, you cannot doubt about. And uh, the Cartesian subject is so strong that it can even split itself into two separate dimensions, the res cogitans and the res extensa, without this affecting the original and therefore irreducible certainty of the ego's unity, the solidity of its consciousness, and through it of the body itself. This substance, the ego, constituted by the certain self, cannot but be egocentric, because everything that there is, and that everything that can be known, is ego. And therefore it is devo devoid of any essential relation with other consciousnesses and with the world. And from this it comes the modern individualism and the inability to think of morality and politics, if not in terms of abstract relations, between uh, separated individuals. The postmodernist critique objects that this is a form of solipsism and that it is vain and above all illusion. After four centuries of attempt to found, to ground every possible knowledge and every possible politics on this idea of the subject, uh, the subject has proved itself to be not at all solid and certain. The ideas are not so clear and distinct, and individuals live in fragmented, in a fragmented world and live solitary lives. So this is the first criticism. The second criticism is the modern conception of rationality is instrumental and absolutist. Human reason is the ultimate and definitive court of knowledge for everything, and the knowledge can be based exclusively on those clear and distinct ideas that appear incontrovertible to the subject with a rational, uh, with an instrumental rationality, a calculating rationality. This absolute conception of knowledge, as Bernard Williams has defined it in relation to the cover, to the covers, is naturally the basis of the modern scientific enterprise which is driven by an intrinsic reductionist impulse. All that escapes the range of the method, the scientific method, not only falls from knowledge, but literally falls from existence. Knowledge is the real, and knowledge is what can be known with certainty through the analytical geometric method and sensible experiences. Or, if you take another version, because this is the positive version of this reductionism, according to the idealistic version of this reductionism, knowledge is a part of the self-awareness of the spirit. And therefore nothing falls outside of the spirit itself. Nothing falls outside the transhistorical subject with the capital S of which Hegel used to speak about. The scientific constructions, no less than the idealistic uh, uh, buildings, are in this perspective the simple development of the conception of the uh, modern rationality. Although they ended up opposing each other in the most radical of the cultural clashes of modernity, that between the so-called natural sciences, Naturwissenschaften, and the so-called historical or human sciences, the Geisteswissenschaft. This word is only apparent. There are two sides of one coin. That's the criticism. 
Postmodernism here argues that the cathedrals of knowledge have consumed themselves in vertiginous collapses. The method has been shattered into a multiplicity of incons incomprehensible languages, the linguistic games, spoken of by Wittgenstein and Detroit. And above all, the absolutist claim of knowledge and reason has shown a totalitarian face, both in the definition of acceptable forms of subjectivation and in the social structures of oppression and inequality generated by the capitalist system. So this was the second criticism made by postmodernist thinkers to modernity. The third criticism is modernity has placed itself already in its original oppositions to the Middle Ages, and in giving itself the name of modern, inside a conception of a finalistic history, teleological conception, a teleological conception of history marked by the necessity. The telos of history is taught by other thinkers, according to postmodernists, uh, as necessary. We will reach the telos and this is necessary also in terms of social movements and of political development. We are modern because we are those who live now, the Latin modo, from which the, the word modernus comes, means now, at the present. We live now and we find ourselves one step ahead of those who have preceded us. And we move towards a direction, the magnificus magnificent and progressive fate, uh, the spaciousness, which Leopardi already mocked upon. Uh, the direction we are heading to toward, it promises the realization of a bright and happy destiny. The sense of an imminent dynamism in history, guaranteed by the unstoppable development of reason and knowledge, is inscribed in the conception of the self of the, of the modern human, in his confidence in himself and in his means. Science, according to the positivists, or the spirit, according to the idealists, will necessarily complete their path of self-transparency up to an absolute knowledge that will conclude the dynamics of history. It will not be possible to go beyond certain forms of knowledge once we have reached the top of certain forms of knowledge, we will have reached the test, that's the end. So some forms of state, some forms of morality will be the forms that will be imposed everywhere. In this perspective, uh, Fukuyama could speak about the idea of the end of history. We have reached the top, so the rest of the time will be just uh, coming up to terms with this top. And we are, of course, at the top, and the other people will have to reach us. The idea was, back in uh, 1991, two years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, the idea was that one cannot go beyond the liberal democracy. And in the aftermath of the fall of the Berlin Wall, this was the definitive form of political and economic life which will also take place outside of the Western world. This colonialist inclination of reason, because it is clearly colonialist, which has actually been one of the self-justifying mechanisms of European colonialism, is motivated precisely by the philosophy of history based on the idea of necessary progress, at the head of which is the absolutist reason mentioned above. And here, postmodernist thinkers have a winning game to show that, on one hand, the promise of happiness in the philosophy of modern history has too often turned out to be fallacious. We have seen bad things in late modernity. And on the other hand, that this promise is indeed a distorted dream of domination over other forms of knowledge and on other conceptions of history. And to this claim, Postmodernist thinkers respond precisely with the declaration and indeed with the hope that the end of history will be the renunciation of the claim of domination by the modern subjects. We have to bring history to an end in the sense that we have to give up the idea of 
history heavy, having an end at all, give up the idea that there is a telos, a sense in history. There is no sense in history, because if you think that there is a sense in history, you will be a violent dominator. Now, these points, if we apply them not to the whole of modernity, starting in the 15th century to the 20th century, but specifically to 19th century philosophies, and especially positivism and idealism, I think they are indeed pertinent. They do catch a point. This critique is very useful. The opposing systems of scientist positivism and historicist idealism seems to really be based on different versions of these assumptions. In both cases, they think about a subject capable of, a, of an unshakable self-evidence, which constitutes the foundation of a knowledge which is certain, cumulative, and corresponding to a progression in the stages of knowledge no less in the, than in the epochs of history. It matters little that in the case of positivism, positivism, the only subject capable of advancing that knowledge is the scientific and empiricist individual. Why? For idealism, the subject is a trans-individual, spiritual, and communal subject. In both cases, the subject is the foundation, knowledge is cumulative, and above all, the historical process is necessary guaranteed by the scientific method or by the logic of the concept, the science of logic by Hegel. And in any case, history is inevitable and therefore also right in justifying even the most radical sacrifices. Now, against this view, uh, what I would like to, to be clear about is that if, the, if we take postmodern criticism against scientism and idealism, I think they are quite right. What is wrong is that positivism and idealism, they are not the whole of modernity. Modernity is much richer than that. It's much differentiated than that. And besides, I would be even harder on this, uh, positivism and idealism, they are a treason of the ideals of the first modernity the early modernity. And I'll show why this is so. We can take a closer look at what modernity really has been. We can indeed say that in modernity, and in particular, in particular in the period that goes from the humanistic Renaissance, 15th, 16th century, to the Enlightenment, the first part of modernity, which I call early, or early modernity, we can trace concepts of the subjects, of knowledge, and of history, but these conceptions do not embody those criticisms. Let me quote a few examples here. Already in the card, the moral subject in the card is much less certain of itself than it is imagined by postmodernist critics. And the Cartesian subject dares only to, to outline a temporary morality. Practical matters are complex and modern thinkers recognize that. They look for a method for a science which can go on methodically, but in practical matters they know that the questions are hard and tough and there is no definitive method over there. Take Michel de Montaigne, which is an important part of modernity. In his essays, the ego, the self, speaking by itself, is constituted by putting itself in a radical crisis through a serene but merciless reflection which leads to a subjectivity that it's anything. It is complex, but it is not really triumphant. Montaigne says, well, I have a lot of problems, I have a lot of facts, and though what I can do is to be honest. And being honest, I recognize that still I can do something. For example, being honest. And for example, trying to build up my identity, which is something that I am doing through my book. And the book has made me rather than I made the book. So, not the subject. But the experience makes the subject. 
Think about John Locke. In, in Locke, knowledge and morality are subjected to the scrutiny and experience, and for this reason, of intersubjectivity, to the comparison between perspectives, none of which can be considered absolute, and hence, tolerance is the basis of society. And in Kant, cognitive and practical faculties are critically scrutinized to define precisely their proper and misplaced uses. And freedom as autonomy is placed in an intrinsic relationship with all persons. We must look at the third formula of the categorical imperative, the realm of ends. It is intersubjective and nobody possesses the truth, no subject in this strain of modernity possesses any truth, any complete total knowledge, or the uh, dominates history. Confrontation of reasons is the law. Confrontation of ideas and confrontation of, of, of autonomy. So, there is a certain continuity between the subject of the early modernity and that of the Enlightenment united by a critical awareness of and a practical orientation in which certainties are problem elements, starting materials for building revisable buildings of knowledge and revisable ideas of coexistence. And history here appears as a possibility of progress, not as a destiny or a deterministic necessary development. It is freedom as a distinctive element of the human being that makes it way in modern anthropology compared to the essentialist vision of the past. And it is a freedom which has some criteria, but it is not certain of itself. There is an internal validation and an external limit, that of the comparison between reasons among three subjects. Postmodernist criticism, therefore, in my perspective, unites elements that are too different from each other in a singly, single summary judgment. It addresses objections to the first modernity and enlightenment that appear appropriate only if referred to backward projections of typical features of 19th century <laughs> philosophy and culture. There is, on the contrary, at least I would like to contend this, to, to, to maintain this, to argue for this, there is a profound discontinuity between these systems, the, the systems of positivism and idealism, and those elements of the modern that we have sketchily summarized above. In the early modernity, we find a finite uh, subject, not sub subjectivity, which, is, which has limits. We have a critical idea of knowledge, not an absolutist idea of knowledge, and we have an open conception of history. And this, to these, I think, we should stick to. What is the essence of modernity then? An essence which might have been uh, forgotten in the uh, 19th century systems. I think this essence is the rejection of dogmatism. The Cartesian move, as well as Montaigne's skepticism and Locke criticism of innatism, must be primarily interpreted as a step away from the visions of crystallized knowledge, politics, politics and history, in which subjectivity plays a secondary role, which was the criticism uh, posed to medieval structures, medieval systems. They were crystallized. They did not allow any progress, any criticism. You could not make any criticism in knowledge when everything is essential and defined. A similar refusal is in some way echoed even in postmodernist criticism, critics of modernity. A certain vision of reason, knowledge, and social coexistence has finally imposed itself, but only in the 19th and 20th century. So, postmodernism reacts, so to speak, to what we, we may call the late modern dogmatism of idealism and positivism. Just as well, early modernity reacted to medieval dogmatism. So, they, postmodern and early modern, they share the idea that 
they are critics of any dogmatic position. And this is the essence of modernity. First, it seems to me to be the essence of modernity. One of the recurring features of postmodernism is, in fact, the aspiration to overthrow or abandon or overcome those forms of associated life that, through the play of subjections and uh, the uh, oppression created on, on the basis of non-negotiable truths, uh, these forms of associated life put the subjects, the individuals, in pre-established and often invisible cages. And this is a kind of, of uh, critique which has value and early modern thinkers would definitely approve of it. The economic political status quo has become the late modern dogma, especially when it has been declared definitively successful or ever everlasting. So the postmodernist diagnosis appears erroneous not because it traces the perils, the dangers of dogmatism, because this is true and this is useful. It is the, the, the postmodernist diagnosis is false because it does not distinguish between early modernity and late modernity. Furthermore, during this, refusing all the way up completely the idea of rationality, any form of rationality, the idea of any subjectivity, the idea of any direction in history. During this, by refusing the whole of modernity without making distinctions, postmodernism deprives itself of the only possible basis for every sensible attempt to make a real critique of dogmatism and to realize at least some forms of emancipation. In the name of what? Can one criticize the oppressive structures of late modernity, if not out of a more autonomous subjectivity, out of a knowledge more aware of, one, of, its, limited, of its limits, and out of a vision of history in which another world is possible, is still possible? On the other hand, we need to, do we really need to abandon the idea of a subject? Do we really need to abandon any idea of reason? Can we, we really do that? In the name of what? Because reason has contradicted itself during modern history. Isn't this a rational argument? This is clearly a rational argument. So, in a way, the problem is with postmodernism that refusing the instruments of critique, they, the postmodernism, uh, deprives itself of the possibility of critique, of the status quo. So the status quo be becomes not criticizable. And I think Jürgen Habermas is right when he writes that postmodernism is an essentially neoconservative movement. The priming ourselves of the basis of criticism, namely reasonableness and subjectivity, postmodernism risks handing down contemporary culture into the hands of every form of dogmatism. Because if we don't have any point in criticizing anyone because we don't have any faith or any trust in reason, then something different from reason comes up and dominates the scene. Religion, ideologies, different kinds of dogmas, and so on. So, we need to go back, in my opinion, against these uh, possible consequences of postmodernism, which have had a long history in the last 50 years. I think that postmodernism post was uh, dominant, at least between the 60s and the end of the millennium. We have to react to this. We, we need to react to this because history is calling us to do something, to take initiative, to have faith in the ability to avoid, for example, 
the consumption of the planet, the distortions of globalization, the raising of harder and harder conflicts on a global scenario. The real problem with the, uh, the environmental crisis, crisis is not that the planet will cease to, to exist or to, uh, or to host us. The problem is that the environmental crisis is a social and political crisis. And uh, we will probably uh, fall down. We will have a lot of problems because of the social conflicts that will be generated also by the environmental crisis. And we have to do something about this. But if we have no reason, no subject, and no direction in history, what shall we do? We just sit down and wait. This is my accusation toward postmodernism. Modern thinking has a lot of resources to help us uh, remake or work as modern people. What I call neo-modernity is just our condition in the present, uh, which is similar by many strands uh, to what was the, the situation at the beginning of modernity. So we can look back at that situation, but of course we do not need to do the same. We need, just need to do a new attempt to uh, elaborate a conception of reason, of history, and of the subject, which is aware of the limits that the first attempt at the beginning of the early modernity encountered. We are aware of the, those limits. For example, the limits of thinking the subject in a too totalitarian way, thinking the knowledge in a too absolutist way, thinking history in a necessary perspective. That is an error that we should, should not make anymore because we know, we have seen it. The early models haven't seen that, didn't see that at the beginning. One of the resources available to us, created by early modernity, is utopian thought. Utopia has been, since the coining of the name in the work of Thomas More in 1516, one of the ways in which the modern has ventured the thought and the imagination of a just and tolerant society and of a methodical but open and shared knowledge, a humanistic knowledge, a knowledge made up of uh, a knowledge about the world and a knowledge about humans, culture and, and uh, poetry and, and music and, and all the rest. The culture in Utopia, in Moore's Utopia, is both scientific and humanistic and classical. They read the classics. They have some scientific knowledge, but for example, Moore's, Moore's Utopia is very different from the New Atlantis by Bacon. The New Atlantis is technocratic, scientistic. That is a different strength. So, However strange and often unacceptable are some of the solutions proposed by the utopians to us, the spirit of utopia, as Ernst Bloch called it, aims essentially, already in Moore's work, towards a liberated society. A society liberated from the yoke of servile labor, from political conflicts, from inequality, from superstition and conflict. These are the ideas. They are simple ideas. And the ingenuity of Moore's utopia is that is just trying to depict, to describe a society where there is no conflict, where there is uh, equality, where the labor is only the labor which is necessary to, to offer the goods which we all together need, and everybody works. So they are quite simple ideas. The, the real challenge was to imagine concretely, vividly, how a society would look like in that perspective. And that's, that's the power of utopian thought. Utopian thought does not derive the structures of a good society from abstract principles. Utopian thought uses images, imagination, to project ourselves into a society in which we feel expresses the ideals of justice and of happiness. 
Utopian turn is imaginary before being uh, rational. It is rational because this imagination is not just fantasy. It's not just wishful thinking. It designs institutions, uh, everyday life, relationships, ideals, economics, uh, politics. So it is an imagination which works uh, using rationality or rather reasonableness as a guide, but it is still imagination. And from that imagination of what the good society would look like, utopian thought uh, goes back to the possible principles of that society. In the case of Moore's Utopia, you discover that the principle, one of the principles which make this, that society just equal and happy is the abolition of private property. But it is one of the principles and it is different from, uh, it, it is not exactly the abolition of private property, the point is the common propriety of the goods. The goods are, belong to everybody, not to the community, to everybody. So it is important that we uh, try to not to revive more utopia, but to write our utopias. And of course, visual arts and literature and poetry and cinema and, and, and even television, if you like, although I don't like, um, are really helpful, are, are the ways in which we create those images. Well, in, in one way, you, you can see traces of this attempt to, to imagine uh, a, a possible world along lines which do not repeat the errors of the past. This is the modern effort within contemporary world. So my suggestion would be, let's try to sketch some utopian ideas. They will probably have to face two big issues which more didn't have to face. The global perspective, utopia in more in Thomas More's work is an island. It is difficult to reach it and it is isolated from the rest of the world. We can not think in this way anymore. So this is neo-modernity. More was thinking about the nation state and the nation states were rising at that time. So it's natural. It's more utopia. It's early modern utopia. A new modern utopia is global, otherwise it can't be, because we are in the globalization, in the global sphere. And second, it will have to face the fact that being a global scenario, extremely complex and out of our control, all we can do is to imagine some fragments, some points, in a general picture. And these points are goals. They are goals which may look not reachable, but in reality they could be. And to me, and this is just to conclude, one of the images of a new modern utopia is exactly Agenda 2030, the 17 of Sustainable Development Goals. If you look at them, there is not so much about environment there. There is a lot about justice, just institution, uh, gender equality, uh, no hunger, uh, innovation, of course, and of course, protection of the land. But first of all, good education, good relationships. Those goals, they are, have been declared objectives, mm. aims, practical aims. We, Many nations, not all of them, have taken the commitment to try to realize them. That's utopia, absolutely. But that doesn't mean that we have that we, that we don't have to go there. And we can go try to go there. First of all, we have to go there, otherwise we will die. But uh, we have to go there, and we can go there. We can try to go there. We can try to save ourselves only if we have a little faith in a critical conception of reason, in an uh, aware conception of the subject with its limits, 
and in a conception of history which is still open. We still have history ahead of us, and it depends on us. The destiny will depend on us. It will not depend on a destiny traced by a god or a spirit or, or a philosophy or a science. It's up to individuals and, and societies and communities and states. States. So, this is more or less my conclusion. The non-existing place, utopia, is a possible place. In fact, it is the not yet existing, not non-existing place. But the concrete and specific traits of the just society will depend on the times and the places where real people will live their real lives here and elsewhere in the global world. The exploration of this neo-modern space, not yet existing, but needed, much needed, is the task facing us. And this exploration requires us to undertake a totally new journey in history. Thank you.